what are your thoughts on, on whether it's age or some other elements or factors when the couple is ready for marriage or is it is money an issue or, or what are your thoughts on when they're ready? Okay, that's more practical. This is my nickel, take your, you know, take your choice. So this is personal opinion. I believe that our culture has extended childhood unnaturally. When you reach puberty is when you should get married. That your sexual urges should be fully satisfied when you're ready to have them satisfied. Uh, but we've extended and pushed childhood to where you have someone in their 30s living at home and they're a child. No accountability, no res nothing. And our culture is wrong, dead wrong. Because of extending childhood, college becomes the time of sowing your wild oats mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the frat houses. And, the, and So we have created a vast amount of immorality mm -hmm. by not having our children marry at an early age. Mm -hmm. Number two, marriage is within the sovereign sphere of the family. The most important issue the main issue, when did the parents of both sides agree it's time for you to get married? And do they understand it is better to marry than to what? Lust. Burn. Would they rather have you fornicating on the weekends or being married and making grandchildren? It's a very simple question. If the parents have a brain that works, but then often I deal with parents who are thinking money, position, they have other things and they don't understand by telling their son and the daughter don't get married, they're telling them just go out and fornicate or go to a whorehouse. Satisfy your urges until you do get married. Well, you see, that's not consistent. So what do I say to a young couple, actual case, I will not give their name, they wanted to get married, I think he was 19, etc. And uh, the parent, neither parents wanted it. They wanted him to get a degree in engineering, which he never got, etc., etc., etc. I said, if you love each other and you feel that God has brought you together to be married as two Christians, uh, and you're willing to struggle, Ann and I rented an apartment above a garage. I work part-time job, she worked, and you're willing to struggle when you're first married, get married. Because when you find you've reached that stage in your relationship with each other, that the next step is intercourse. You have to get married. It is better to marry than one. Burn. So when a couple you reach that position that your love for each other should be expressed by sex. And you're going to tell yourself to wait five years because your parents said five years? No, you're ready now. In those kinds of situations, if you go for premarital counseling and you fully understand all the problems at marriage and what it gives and you understand all of that, uh, then you can get married. And probably your marriage will last. But the key is, if you have a relationship which has reached the point, either you fornicate or you get married, you get married. Period. That's very blunt. Yeah, I remember my, my, my pastor was speaking on that issue a while back. We were going through uh, the book of Luke <clears throat> and the narrative of, uh, narrative of Joseph and Mary and everything. So we were discussing, or the pastor was preaching yeah. on the ages of, of Mary and Joseph. And, um, and he said very much a similar, same, well, he didn't elaborate quite as much, but he said that in that culture, they would get married at very young ages. So he, he scholars he believe... Married. The girl had to be through puberty. Right. Maybe scholars believe that Mary was between 12 and 14 or something yeah. like that. And he said the reason, which is what Dr. Bob was just saying, the reason was because of issues of lust. If you, if you put this off, then you just have people fornicating. And so that it, it's interesting that you brought all that up because that yeah, was going to be I, one I, of my questions today. <laughs> <laughs> what is the appropriate age for yeah. marriage? Biblically, but not see, I culturally. I taught my children this, but as my daughter said, 
She said, finding a godly man in California was like finding a good parking space. <laughs> By the time you got there, all the good ones were taken and the only ones left were handicapped. <laughs> she kept looking and God didn't bring Dwayne in her life until she reached basically 30, which was later. Um, she was willing, but she had her standards of godliness. And that's where the girls must understand you don't settle for someone just to have someone. He must be like Christ to you. And you just don't grab the first woman that comes along. She must be Proverbs 31. When you marry that way, it'll last 40 years. I am to be to my wife what Christ is to the church. So on a practical level, like in, in this culture, where like a 14 or 15 year old can't rent an apartment or, you know. No. So how do they leave and cleave? How do they leave, yeah. you know, do they live? Well, well would you work to get married? You, you, you have a problem of uh, maturity. You need to at least get through high school. You need to trade. I mean, Joseph was a carpenter when he married. He could provide for her. So if the kid cannot provide, right. and he's a kid, the answer is no. But at 18, you can rent an apartment. Okay. Just but like even you can get a job. But even is it even maturity a cultural thing? No. I mean, because maturity is an individual thing. Well, no, I, I, no, I do agree with that. But I mean, <laughs> culture seems to uh, have a, play a big role in that as well. I mean, the way we're well, raising our children. Degree, and yeah. But I mean, maturity, there's certain things that have always been true. I told my kids, the day you pick up trash off our lawn without me telling you to do so, I know you're mature. The day you get your room straightened, not because I yelled, but because you wanted to. The day you pay your bills and take responsibility for yourself and your habits and your on down the line, then I know you become an adult. When I was a child, I did what? Childish things. But when I became an adult, I put that away. So I have to see you're putting away childish things. But getting back to what he was saying, yeah. um, you know, when the hormones kick in, when the, any of you said the puberty, uh, menstrual cycle, whatever. Uh, and the principle of not wanting to burn with lust doesn't necessarily mean that uh, p maturity of character is going to come along with that. Yes. Um, like at 13, you know, I was an idiot. <laughs> I, I think I still was kind of an idiot. He was a horn dog <laughs> <Yeah>. at 13. <laughs> 13, 14. Danny met me when I was 16, and she said, you were the nicest 40-year-old, 16-year-old. I, <laughs> I worked made my own money, worked as an elevator man, a doorman, a garbage man. Uh, I never knew what it was to be an idiot. I worked my whole life. Mm -hmm. That's the culture I was raised in. And I look at people today, I don't know how they get the time or the money to live the life of a fool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the parents failed you. Your parents mm -hmm. failed you. Mm -hmm. See, they were brought up, oh, he's just sowing his wild oats, he's got to find himself. No, if your parents had told you, like the Jews, at the age of 12, what happens to the boy in a Jewish community? What is farm that? He becomes a man. Hmm? He becomes a man. You are now an adult, and you can put the yarmulke on. It takes 12 men to start a service. You now... I can wear the yarmulke, and I am a man, and I can start the service. Mm -hmm. You're now a man. Now you have to put away childish mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Would that Christians had such a rite of passage. Even the pagans do in Africa. And they have those ceremonies, mm -hmm. and, you know, to become a man, a ritual of manhood, and then after that, there's no longer... So the burning with lust issue wouldn't be an overriding principle to say, hey, you 14-year-old, you should get married. No. You know? I mean, you can't no. do it in our culture anyway, but... No, no, and at 14, that it's not... They've shown the hormones around 18. There are three waves of hormones. Three times 
<laughs> when like the ocean. The tsunami. <laughs> 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 Big old typhoon. Another question over here? Did you have one? I had one on, um, actually on Islam. <clears throat> okay. Uh, in the Quran, chapter 3, verse 4, it says, He has sent down to thee the book containing the truth and fulfilling that which precedes it. And he sent down the Torah and the gospel before this as a guidance to the people. Um, okay, so the Quran is saying that, if, uh, that Allah sent down the gospel accounts. And we see in the gospel accounts um, Christ instituting the Lord's Supper and to be celebrated until the end of the world as a remembrance. Do Muslims celebrate the Lord's Supper? And if they do, um, why are they not dropping dead as a result? And if they don't, why not? Well, number one, when the Quran was put together, remember Muhammad did not write it, it was multiple authors. Mm -hmm. Islam <coughs> created the Quran, not vice versa. Islam created Muhammad. The authors of the Quran were totally ignorant of both the Old and New Testament. I told you that it becomes manifest throughout the Quran. Number two, but they wanted Jews and Christians to become Muslims. So they claimed that Allah first gave the Torah. Oh. Come in, come in. Are you still what? Are you okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Torah and then the next step in evolution was the gospel. And then the next step in evolution, Islam. So think of progressive revelation, progressive religion. That's why the Baha'is argue that way. All nine world religions are in an escalator. Number two, when they finally were confronted by Christians and Jews, who knew their respective scriptures and saw the immediate contradiction between the Quran, the Torah, and the Gospel, the Muslim apologists decided the easiest way to deal with this is to say the Torah that is referred to there and the Gospel referred to there are long lost scriptures. The Old Testament today, the New Testament today, has no reference to that. There was the original back in Muhammad's day that has been lost. They try to argue that way today. Of course, we point out we have plenty of manuscripts before the 6th century, and that this shows that they are the fraudulent one. This is a contradiction they cannot handle. The moment you point out, we have copies of both the Torah and the Gospel before uh, Muhammad. And what the Quran says contradiction. They say, well, even those are fake. They're frauds. Mm -hmm. The true one is somewhere. Mm -hmm. Somewhere. And when you persist, then they get angry and say they're going to kill you. <laughs> That's my experience. Yeah. But see, you can't argue to show contradiction between the Bible and the Quran because they said the Bible was written after the Quran and contradicts the Quran Whereas the no would have written before. That's their sleight of hand. <clears throat> That's why they always try to make the Bible as a later construction, right? So that they can fit in the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Because it's an impossible situation there. Absolutely impossible. All the New Testament manuscripts have Christ crucified. The Quran says he was not crucified. Right there. Right there. Immediate. Yep. Okay, we have in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaching the gospel, 3,000 are saved, 3,000 are then baptized. Yes. Are we being disobedient by not baptizing converts immediately? Uh, no, because there's no command, go ye and do likewise. The book of Acts is a historical account, not a theological account, of what happened no judgment as to whether or not it was right or wrong. The judgment of history comes later. For example, the early Christians in that same section 
sold everything they have and brought the money to the feet of the preachers. And they lived in a communal situation where everybody had everything in common. What happened? The Church of Jerusalem and the Christians went totally bankrupt. Paul had to raise money and donations for them because they didn't have any money. Because everybody had given away their savings, their IRA, their keogs. In result, it was a total disaster. So no other church experimented with taking all the wealth of all the members together in a communal pot and then you go get what you need. That failed. But yet the cultists, the Jesus people, <laughs> They did it, therefore we are to do it. No, -uh. there's a lot of things that Christians do we shouldn't do. That was an experiment. The same thing with Pentecost. That was an unusual situation. And we're not given all of the what was involved. The right to immediate baptism, you can say, is there. But the right to take the time to make sure the person understands before they get baptized? Yes. Not inordinately so. I've heard of some Reformed Baptists say, you must have education, catechism for one year. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. Um, I meet with someone. They say they've accepted Christ as their Savior. I talk with them. Within a week or two, I can baptize them, as long as I'm assured of their confession of faith. So you don't have to wait till they give the fruit thereof. Well, how long are you going to wait? How much fruit? It all becomes arbitrary and subjective. I don't like it. But just the principle, just because you have it in historical narrative, does not put the word ought. Right. And the moment they try to argue, I say, give me all your money. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not willing to give the money? Then don't talk to me about that. We talk money first, baptism second. <laughs> um, and I want to go 15 minutes more. That's fine. 30. Okay, then you make, one? The, make this a quick Greg one. Greg Hammond? That was Greg. That was, oh, okay. That was Did it. that help? Yeah, you threw in the Acts chapter, but that's, that's good. I was, no, I was just thinking more of the Matthew 28, you know, go make disciples, baptizing them, and, you know, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. What do I have to do? Well, if you believe Yeah, the great... Work. Oh, yeah, yeah. In other words, the right to expedient baptism, you can prove that from historical example, right. but there's no oughtness to it. You have to have, go ye and do likewise. Where in the epistles is that taught as a doctrine or a command? It isn't. Thankfully, uh, we don't have to give all our money to the preacher either. Um, make this a one a quick one. On, I'm trying to find. I can't remember. It's in Corinthians. I don't remember if it's First or Second Corinthians. I thought it was Chapter Ten, but I'm not seeing it. But you'll know what I'm talking about. Where Paul is discussing the issue of avoiding certain individuals, and he says you cannot avoid the world because chapter you have. Five, is it five? Mm -hmm. Okay. Chapter. You cannot avoid the world. He said, when I tell you not to have anything to do with these people, I was not talking about unbelievers. Right. So you'd, my, have to go to the, you'd have to go to the moon. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I was talking about professing Christians who do these things. Right. So, I, I, can you expand upon what Paul's talking about there when he says, you cannot have anything to do with these professing Christians? All right. Well, number How one, do we handle that? Because a lot okay. of people will say, no, we need, to, we need to talk to them. We need to encourage them. All right, okay, you got to realize 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians. Right. There was an epistle before this epistle, and he's referring to issues that he dealt with there, people that he mentioned there, and he, now he needed to correct them because they misunderstood him when he said, don't have anything to do with these people. They thought that meant people in general who do those things. So here you have a, a single guy, and he's out of fornicating with girls. And they say, well, anyone who fornicates. So now he's correcting a misunderstanding. What I meant, he goes to church with you, he's a professing Christian, he's the one that you rebuke. But see, that had already been discussed in first, the first, first epistle. First, first. <laughs> so you are dropping in the middle of a discussion of an issue that had been dealt with previously. That's why 
it's only a brief mention to correct a wrong impression from a previous letter to which we do not have access. So our understanding of exactly what Paul was getting at is not... We can only say whatever he's, the people he's talking about, the, the Corinthians misunderstood and they made it across the board to everybody and he said they're idiots. You'd have to move uh, to the moon. So when I have a Christian say to me, well I don't stay at a Marriott because a Mormon owns that. And I hear that the Catholics own uh, uh, Pizza Hut. And I said, look, you don't boycott unbelievers and their business. My poor grandmother said, I can't go back to my hairdresser, though I love him. Why? He's a homosexual. <laughs> I said, they make the best hairdresser. <laughs> and she said, you mean, I, I said, I said, Grammy, does he have to eat? Does he have to pay his rent? You go and be a light to him and be a delight. I mean, I can go. I said, Scripture doesn't say have nothing to do with him. If he went to First Baptist with you and was flying around buzzing with wings, that's a different <laughs> issue. And that, and that is my question. So say someone like this, we, could, we are to completely cut these people off. If they are professing that, yeah. Christians, you don't have anything more. You will not eat with them. That's Second Thessalonians. Okay. You don't extend. I don't even give them the right hand. If they put the hand out to shake my hand, I, I do this. Okay. I do not even say Godspeed. Nothing. Okay. Completely shut off. Okay, Sam. Sam they should be shunned. One uh, more, and I think that's about uh, it. Uh, if a former Mormon showed up at your church and had three wives and five children, what would be the church's responsibility to... Um, Tell. What, would, what would be the church's response to that? What is, is you must faithfully provide for your wives and your children. Just don't marry another fourth one. <laughs> so you remain with the three wives? You, of course. Oh, so your question, let me let me see if I understand the question. You, he's, he converts to Christianity. Yeah, and he already has three but wives. But he already has three wives. But, and five but kids. you he can't tell him to get rid of the two and keep the one. Missionaries oh. in Africa tried that. And you know what happened? They murdered the, uh, the excess wives. <clears throat> they killed them. They would disqualify them for leadership. Obviously. They could not be an elder or a deacon, but they could be a, he could be a member, and the wives hopefully are saved, but he has a responsibility for the children that he has raised and his, uh, to keep, keep that going. It doesn't mean you approve of it, sanctify it. You're saying what is, is. So those marriages are valid? Mm -hmm. Those marriages are valid then? Yes, uh, because he already cohabitated I, with them. I was thinking perhaps, like, my, I was thinking about my response. I was thinking maybe, like, you know, stay with the original one and have the other two housed somewhere else but so, still provide for them. Now, historically, that's not where the early church yeah. happened. They lived in a polygamous world, mm -hmm. and they said you can't have leadership position. But what is is, of course, you continue to love and care for them and your children and all your children. And don't get any new but ones. But doesn't, okay. <laughs> but what do we do with the fact that in the United States, polygamy is illegal? Realize it's a money issue and taxes. Right, but it's not recognized. It's not bearing on the fact that he has a responsibility to these women and to these children. Okay, so his responsibility biblically is going to override the state's of authority saying... But he can't claim them as a tax writer. As long as you don't claim the tax exemption, the government will not bother you. That's why there are so many Mormons who are polygamous and no, no government. It's when you decide not to pay any taxes, then they come after. So even though Christ... But see, that issue was dealt with in the early church. Why can't we do what they did? And say, no more wives. What is, is. You love them, care for them. You can't be an elder. That's why it says, married to marry only one woman. Okay. And um, that's the way it is. But nobody would say to be cruel, uh, to throw them out on the street, yeah. kill them. Uh, or, yeah, but there are Christians who run around saying, "Why well, just throw the other two out and keep them up? What a testimony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, again, more follow-up. When Christ says, 
we, we read this passage earlier, and he refers to creation, the creation account. Yeah. He said, one man and one woman. Yeah. If he you says... You educate him, that's the way it should have been. Right, but if he says, if Christ himself, the new lawgiver, says marriage is between one man and one woman, how can that polygamous marriage be valid in the eyes of God? Because then he dealt with the fall and the fact that there are valid reasons for divorce. That one man, one woman can be divorced. And he gave an exception there for Nian, and Paul gives it for separation. So even though marriage was set up at creation, it can be broken. And the woman at the well, Jesus said, you have had five husbands. Yes. We don't know how legal that was. I'm just saying the early church dealt with this. The early missionaries dealt with this. By the missionaries of Africa said, if they're polygamous, they come to Christ, they remain with their wives and children, but they don't add, and then they teach the children and they teach the rest that this is not the thing to do, but what is, is. Beautiful. Oh, All right, now ask me some questions. Yes. Ask me some questions. Sometimes you like to the... Why are you such a dumbass? Well, well, I can't answer. Because it's a difficult question. You have to buy my question. You have to buy my book. Read it in my book. I could expand. I mean, there was, I mean, there was stuff with what I already yeah. did. Yeah. I could also yeah. extend it and do the rest yeah. of the world. Yeah. 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 Look at it. That's where we were. Look. Went Remember when I told you we went to Starbucks? Chris? Oh, yeah, yeah. We were right down there. You could have looked at us and waved. Oh, oh, we got the ocean <laughs> from the balcony. <laughs> 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 